Well, now we're ready for the big question of this part of the course. What is a derivative? We've hinted at it, and we've looked at some preliminary results as we looked at rates of change. But now we can actually get to the point of giving a definition of the derivative, which is a sort of derived function. And we'll look at slopes of tangent lines while we're at it. So we'll get right to it. Here is the definition of the derivative of a function. What we do is we start with a given function, and we create a new function from it. So the function, which we will call f prime, now that is very unimaginative as far as notation goes. Good notation in mathematics ought to reflect what it is talking about. All this does is say, I'm not f, I'm different from f, I'm f prime. And later we'll have better notation for this. But right now that's convenient, and we'll use it. The function f prime, which is derived from f, that's why this function f prime is going to be called a derivative. The function f prime derived from f and defined by, and here's the definition, and you won't be surprised, I hope, f prime of x, okay, there's the new notation. Now what is it going to be equal to? Well, it's that object we've been examining again and again. The limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. The difference of y values as x goes from x to x plus h over h. We've seen this again and again. We saw it when we talked about tangent slopes, where this difference quotient was the secant slope, and we took the limit to get the tangent slope. We saw it when we talked about velocities, where this expression, this difference quotient, was the average velocity. And in here, when we took the limit, we got the instantaneous velocity. And then that generalized up to general rates of change. This function derived from f and defined by this expression is called the, and here's its full name, the derivative of the function f with respect to, there's my abbreviation again, with respect to the variable x. This is the definition of the derivative. It is this object here, this limit. When it exists as usual, every limit, of course, may or may not exist depending on circumstances. But when it exists, this is called the derivative. So this function is derived from the original function f here. And it is called the derivative. And we've seen it used before. So you can see why people might think this is an interesting function to examine. And it turns out to be one of the fundamental functions of calculus. So before we go any further, let's do a calculation just to practice. Suppose we want to find f prime of x. And we're given the fact that f of x is equal to, say, something very simple, a polynomial like x squared plus 1. Now, I should mention that as time goes on, we will be wanting to find this derivative in earnest for all sorts of functions. And so we will not want to go to this basic definition all the time. We'd like to have some higher level rules that would make it easier to calculate this. And we will get those. But for now, all we have is the definition. And the definition is certainly something you need to practice to get comfortable with. So f prime of x is by definition, so I can write def here to remind us. This is just the definition. The limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. You should get to the point where you can just recite this quickly, and you'll be able to use it. Then, since we know what the function is, let's go ahead and substitute in for f. We know that the function f is x squared plus 1. So I've, if I'm putting x plus h in for x squared, I'm going to get x plus h quantity squared plus 1 minus the quantity f of x, which is x squared plus 1. And all of that, of course, is still over h. Now, for my convenience, once again, I will pull the 1 over h out front. I will then multiply out the algebra here. And I'll get x squared plus 2hx plus h squared plus 1 minus x squared minus 1 running the minus sign through here. Notice that the x squareds add to 0. The 1 and the minus 1 add to 0. I'm left with two expressions here, both of which have an h in them. So this h can divide into both of them, leading me very quickly to the limit as h goes to 0 of 2x plus h. 
And now with the single H here going to zero, I'm left with 2x. This is the derived function. Let me go ahead and mark f prime of x here so we'll remember. The derived function for the original function x squared plus 1 is this new function 2x. Well, so what? We have cr created this new function, the derivative. Why do we care? Well, if you remember how we built our way up to this, you saw that this function here could represent a formula for slopes of tangent lines. Or in other contexts, it could represent instantaneous velocity and so on. But let's go ahead and examine the notion that this is a formula for slopes of tangent lines and see where that leads us. So this new function, f prime of x is 2x. This is, and this is a handy way to remember this, this is a formula for the slope of the line tangent to the graph of f, which is, remember, the original function from which we derived our derived function, so our original function, at the point x, f of x. So let's look at that again. This formula, f prime of x equal 2x, is a formula for the slope of the line tangent to the graph of f, the original function, at the point x, f of x. So now, if I want to know the slope of the tangent line anywhere, I can calculate it using this formula. For example, if I say, what does the tangent to this function, the original function, remember, was x squared plus 1, at the point 2, 5, which is a point on the curve. The tangent is, well, let's see. Before I can write the tangent, I need the tangent slope. I have a point, so with the point and the tangent slope, I'll be able to write the tangent line, or at least draw it. The tangent slope is going to be equal to f prime at 2, the x value here. And that is 2 times x, so this is going to be 4. And if I look at the picture that I get out of this, x squared plus 1, of course, is the old x squared uh, parabola curve shifted up by 1. So we have some sort of a curve like this. And then that would put 2 somewhere over here. And this would be the tangent line. We have just discovered that the slope of this tangent line is 4. And if I wanted the equation of this line, since I know the point it passes through, I could use that point and that slope to write the equation of the line, which I won't do right now. But you see that I can figure the slope anywhere along this curve using this formula. All I need to know is what is the x value associated with the given point, and then I can put that in here to get the slope of the tangent line at that point. Now. Let's go back and check something that we already know the answer to. It's always good once you have a new result to go back and check things that you already know so that you can see if the new result really is good. Let's check that the tangent slope of the line, an arbitrary line, an arbitrary non-vertical line, I should say, an arbitrary non-vertical line mx plus b is m everywhere. Well, what I'm trying to do is to see that the tangent slope is going to be this constant number m no matter what x value I choose. In other words, I am claiming that if I take the derivative of this function, the formula that I get should be f prime of x equals m. And that's it. Well, let's see if that's true f prime of x is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of the function evaluated at x plus h minus f of x all over h. Well, here I know what the function is again. So the limit as h goes to 0, I'll pull my 1 over h out front. I'm putting x plus h in for x, so I'll have m times x plus h plus b, and then subtract off mx plus b f of x. Well, if you see here, I have mx, 
subtracting mx, so the mx's are gone. Then I have a b subtracting a b, the b's are gone. What is left? This is the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over h. All I have left is an mh. And of course, h over h is 1, so I'm left with the limit of the constant m as h goes to 0. And the limit of any constant is just that constant. And I have now proven what we saw earlier, that the rate of change, or the tangent slope of a line with slope m, ought to be m. So this just confirms that our derivative is giving us the right answer for the line. And we hope also for other curves which are not lines. So let's stop there and we'll then look at instantaneous velocity from this point of view. We have the derivative defined, and we've looked at slopes of tangent lines. Now let's confirm that the derivative is the right answer again for instantaneous velocity. So just continuing from before, we might say further, if we have s of t, and it is a position function, so all we're doing really is taking a special case. If s of t is a position function, then the instantaneous velocity The instantaneous velocity is given by v of t, and we'll stop writing instantaneous now, we'll just call it velocity, is in fact s prime of t, because when I calculate s prime of t by my definition of derivative, I get the limit as h goes to 0 of s of t plus h minus s of t all over h. And that is exactly what I calculated the so-called instantaneous velocity to be earlier. So now I see that that calculation is indeed the derivative. So I have learned that the velocity is the derivative of the position function. And we'll make good use of that later. In fact, I like to remember things this way. If you have the position function here and you move over to the velocity function, what took you there? Well, what took you there was taking the derivative with respect to t. And then one could ask the question, what happens if I took the derivative of the velocity function? What new function would I get from that? Later on we'll learn that that's the acceleration function. And so this is a nice arrangement from position to velocity to acceleration. And in fact, when we get to the integration part of calculus, we'll find out how to reverse that process. But let's leave that for now. We continue to explore this new notion of the derivative. We've seen that it covers the cases of the slope of a tangent line and instantaneous velocity, but then, of course, we designed it to be that way. Now I want to introduce some of the language associated with the derivative, and then we'll get to some of its properties later. First of all, functions differentiable or not at a single point. Now this is a language issue. We say the following. We say that f is differentiable at the point x0. And what does that mean? Has a derivative at x0 is all that it means. We say it's differentiable at x0 if f prime at x0 exists. And that's all there is to it. Now I suppose if this notation, if this language are being invented today, we would try and keep it all the same. We either call this a differential at x0, or we would say that the function f is derivable at x0. So we'd end up using the same word. Unfortunately, this, these are words that we have inherited from history, so we have to learn to deal with them. 
And instead of saying a function is derivable at x0, we say it's differentiable at x0. And we use the word differential for something else later on. So this is a new piece of terminology. And so just as we used to say that a function was continuous at a point, such as x0, we now have a new property, differentiability. Does the function have a derivative there? And therefore, a tangent there. So this would happen if the function has a derivative there at that point. Now, does a function have to have a derivative? Well, of course not. The derivative is defined to be a limit, and limits, as you know, sometimes don't exist. So f can fail to be differentiable at various points. How can it fail? Well, it's going to fail if the limit fails to exist. For example, a function may not have a derivative at corners. So we're talking about graphs that look something like this. There's a corner there. Or it might be the very familiar example, the absolute value function graph, which has a corner there. Why does this cause the limit not to exist? Well, the limit that we are looking for is the limit of secant slopes, remember, as we come from the two sides. And we're hoping that as we take the secant slope limits, we get to one, and only one, tangent slope limit. Well, you can see when you have corners, and this one is particularly dramatic, as you come from the left, the secant slope is one number. From the right, uh, from the right it's one number. From the left, it's another number. And when you get here, if you're taking the limit from the two sides, you get two different numbers. So there is no two-sided limit. So the problem with corners is there's no two-sided limit for the derivative. And of course, with no two-sided limit, you have non-existence. So visually, you look for corners, and you won't have a derivative there. Another case where you won't have a derivative is if vertical tangents crop up. Now what are we talking about there? Well, you might have a function like this one, which would have a vertical tangent right at that point. Or you might even have something like this, where the function comes up on this side and then goes down on the other side and has a vertical tangent at that point. In that case, it's easy to see what's happening, because a tangent that's vertical has no slope, or if you like, infinite slope. So this is where the limit, it's not a real number. It's infinite. So those are two of the cases. There are other cases, but those are two of the classic cases where a function will not have a derivative, and therefore not be differentiable. Now, there's one very classic example. That's the one we just saw, the absolute value function. So let's actually walk through the proof here. The classic example is f of x equals the absolute value of x. And this function, f, is not differentiable at one point only, x equals 0. And that is the picture we saw before, where we have this v shape. And that's a corner, so we would not expect there to be a derivative. OK, what is the proof of this fact that it's not differentiable? Well, we just try and find the derivative there. And somewhere along the line, we should run into some sort of difficulty. So the derivative at 0 should be, by definition, the limit as h goes to 0 of the functional value at 0 plus h. Remember, it's x0 plus h, but the x0 here is 0 minus f at x0, or 0 in this case, all over h. Well, this is not an unknown function. This is the absolute value. So f of 0 plus h is the absolute value of 0 plus h. In other words, the absolute value of h. So this is the limit as h goes to 0 of the absolute value of h minus the absolute value of 0, of course, over h. And that simplifies even more. This is the limit as h goes to 0 of the absolute value of h over h. And that is where the problem arises. Because as long as the h is not 0, then we have to approach h either from the right of 0 or the left of 0. If we approach from the right, here is what happens. If h is greater than 0, and we take this limit, 
then the h absolute value in the top is just h. h over h is 1. The limit becomes 1. However, if the h is less than 0, then the absolute value of this number that is less than 0 is, in fact, minus h. Minus h over h is minus 1. And so this limit, which is supposed to be a single two-sided limit, is different depending on which side you approach 0, which means it isn't a two-sided limit that exists. So no two-sided limit exists. And since that is the case, then this original expression does not exist, meaning there's no derivative of this function at 0. And that's what we were trying to show in this classic example. But let's not leave this just yet. We use this so often that we want to talk about this. So let's come back to this function and, and look at a couple of other properties. This function does not have a derivative at 0, but it does have a derivative everywhere else. So this has a derivative everywhere except that one problem point, except x equals 0. That is to say, f prime of x, where f is this absolute value function, is equal to minus 1 for all the x's that are less than 0, and 1 for all the x's that are greater than 0. And we saw that before, because in the graph, if we come from the right, the slope is 1, and that's what this says. If we come from the left, the slope is negative 1, and that's what this says. If I want to graph this function, remember this is the original function f of x equals the absolute value of x. If I graph the derivative, look what I get. I get this disjoint function, which has no value at 0. And for every value that's positive, it's always 1. For every value that's negative, it's always negative 1. And so this is the, dra this is the uh, graph of f prime of x. So this is interesting. This function, f of x equals absolute value of x, is certainly a continuous function. There's no question about it. There are no breaks. Yet, it does not have a derivative here. So apparently, being continuous is not enough to guarantee that you have a derivative. That's interesting. We'll see where that leads in just a minute. But f prime of x, the derivative itself, is a disjoint step function, which is also interesting. So we'll come back to something else in just a moment. Now, just as a short note, we just talked about functions differentiable or not at a single point, and let's go ahead and extend that notion to intervals, since we often talk about intervals. So, functions differentiable on an interval. Now, this is all similar to the continuity case, when we talked about whether functions were differentiable on intervals, or c continuous on intervals. So, on open intervals, there is nothing really to discuss. On open intervals, all we need is that the function must be differentiable at each point of that open interval. And differentiable, remember, is a two-sided limit. And in open intervals, there's no difficulty. You can approach any point in an open interval from both sides. The problem is, what about on intervals with endpoints? So these would be closed intervals, which have two endpoints, or half open or half closed intervals, which may only have one. The problem is, at the endpoints, you cannot take a two-sided derivative limit. You can only approach from one side. And so we just need to extend the definition of derivative to include a one-sided derivative. We're not going to dwell on this, but let me just mention it. And in fact, I'll only write one of these. The right-hand one is very much the same thing. Let's say, if we want to define a left-hand derivative, then there's actually a notation for it. Instead of just writing f prime of x, we'll write f prime of x, and sometimes a little minus is written here, below the f, as a subscript position. And then when we take the limit, instead of taking h approaching 0 
from both sides. We let h approach 0 only from the left, since this is the left-hand limit. And it is the same difference quotient, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And the right-hand limit, or the right-hand derivative, is similar, except that it comes from the other side. It's h approaching 0 from the right. And you have f prime with a little plus down here. Now, these are not crucial, but what it does allow us to say now, we can talk about functions that are differentiable on intervals, where we mean at the endpoints that it's a left-hand or a right-hand derivative. The next thing we'll look at is a well-known theorem about differentiability and continuity and the connection between them. Now we have a wonderful theorem. The theorem that says a function differentiable at a point, a function that has a derivative somewhere, is also automatically continuous at that point. And this theorem is one that everyone should know. And you should be able to prove this and understand all the steps involved. If f is differentiable, so I'll state the theorem now. If f is differentiable at a point x0, then f is continuous at x0. So this is a classic if-then statement, a single implication. If you have differentiability at a point, then you automatically have continuity. Notice that it doesn't go the other way. If you're continuous at a point, it does not mean you have a derivative there. We know a counterexample. The absolute value function at x equals 0 is continuous, but doesn't have a derivative there. So this function, this theorem, does not go backwards. It does, however, go forwards and turns out to be very useful. So here's the proof. Let's write down all the steps so we know what's going on. First of all, let's make note of our hypothesis. Since f is differentiable at x0, we know that the derivative exists, that is to say, f prime at x0, and let me actually write it out because that'll be helpful to have it as a reminder. The limit of f of x0 plus h minus f of x0 all over h, this exists. Now exists, of course, means it's a real number. And that's going to be crucial to one step in the proof later on. Now, that is just writing down the hypothesis. I haven't done anything yet. Next thing I'm going to do is ask myself, how do I show something is continuous? So this is a reminder to myself to show f is continuous at x0. We must show that in the original definition that the limit of f of x as x approaches x0 equals f of x0. That was our original definition of continuity at x0. Now, we can rewrite this as follows. We can pull the f of x0 over to the left-hand side. And since it is no, has no x in it, we can put it under the limit sign because the limit will not affect it. So we rewrite this as the limit of the quantity f of x minus f of x0 as x approaches x0. And since we've moved the f of x0 over, there's nothing on the right except 0 now. So this is the form in which we're going to use this. In fact, we'll take a step further. Instead of having x approaches x0, if you look up here in our definition of the derivative, we have h approaching 0. And you remember how we did that. We replaced x by x0 plus h. And so we're going to do that here, rewriting once again. Rewriting once more, we need to show, see it's good to keep track of what it is we're trying to do, with x equaling x0 plus h, we need to show that the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x0 plus h minus f of x0 
must equal zero. So that is our goal, to get this expression equaling zero. Now, here is the actual argument. Let's start with the left-hand side here and hope by some argument I can get to the right-hand side, which is zero. Now this expression here can be rewritten using simple algebra as follows. The limit as h goes to zero, and now I will rewrite this as f of x naught plus h minus f of x naught all over h times h. So all I did was put two h's here. Algebraically, this is the same expression as back here. However, now when I take the limit, notice that what happens? This first expression and the limit of a product like this is the product of the limits. We did that with limits. This first expression, when I take the limit as h goes to 0, is exactly f prime of x naught, the derivative. That's its definition. Times, and when I take the second expression, the limit as h goes to 0 of h is, of course, 0. Now, the next step I want to write is that this is 0, because that's what I'm trying to get to, and that would end the proof. And in fact, it does end the proof. But this step here is what uses the hypothesis. Because the only way that 0 times this is going to be 0 is if this, the derivative at x0, is a real number. If it were infinity or didn't exist, then 0 times something that doesn't exist or is infinite is not going to be 0. So the only way that this argument can work is if this is a real number. In other words, that it exists, and that's exactly what the hypothesis assumed. So we are allowed to go down here to 0, and there we have it. We have this theorem, and let me bring it back. If f is differentiable at x0, then f is continuous at x0. A well-known theorem that everyone should be familiar with. You should feel very comfortable proving this and knowing what the steps mean. As is true with every historical subject, like calculus, many notations grow up over time because the calculus was invented and built upon by many people in different countries. And so certain traditions came up in notation. All of them are in use today, and we are going to tell you about a few of the other derivative notations that are out there. Our notation so far for the derivative of a function is to write f prime of x. I did mention already that that's not a very helpful notation because it just says prime, I'm different from f. Here are some other notations that we'll have some explanation later. This first prime notation is very common. Here's another notation, the derivative of f of x with d bar dx. So this is the d for derivative, and this dx means with respect to x. So this does say nicely that x is involved. Another notation that exists is large d sub x of f of x. Now each of these has its advantages. Uh, the big D sub x does remind you that you are differentiating with respect to x. The f prime does not. And this one here with this quotient seems a little strange, but later on I think you'll find it very helpful. If you are given the fact that f of x is equal to y, that y equals f of x, then you can write f prime of x as also y prime, even more simply and less informative, or you could write dy dx, which of course is d dx of y, but when it's just a single y, people write it as dy dx. Now, what if you want to evaluate the function at some point x equal x naught? Well, if you have our first notation with f prime, you just write f prime of x naught. If you have the second notation, the derivative of f of x, what do you do? Well, you put a bar at the right-hand side and you write x equals x naught at the bottom of that bar. If you have dy dx, you do the same thing. Write a bar and then x equals x naught at the bottom of the bar. And you keep that notation up for anything that gives you uh, difficulty. Uh, the only real nice one is this f prime of x naught. 
Now, what else is involved here? There are some other notations. Also, remember we looked at x minus x naught and we replaced it by h. That we've already seen. But it is sometimes also replaced by delta x. This is pronounced delta x. It is a single symbol. It's not a delta times x. It's just a single symbol. And it means a change in x. It means an increment in x. These are all words that are used in various places. Likewise, one could say f of x minus f of x naught, which we've already seen as f of x naught plus h minus f of x naught, can be written, say, as y. Uh, let's see here, y minus y naught, which could be also written as delta y in the same fashion. Now, why would one invent these delta x and delta y notation? Well, it turns out that they're actually useful because dy dx can be written, dy dx meaning the derivative, which is the tangent slope and the limit of the secant slopes, can be written as the limit as delta x goes to 0 of delta y over delta x. So this notation takes the Greek d, which is the delta, into the English d. And one last thing I should mention, I suppose, is this can also be written as delta x approaches 0 of f of x plus, instead of h, delta x minus f of x all over delta x. So these are a variety of notations, and there are a few others out there, but we won't deal with them right now. Just be prepared to learn them as time goes on. Time for some exercises. First, let's look at this exercise. Let's graph a function, say f, with the following properties. Now this is a nice sort of exercise that you can do throughout calculus. As you learn different properties of functions, you can make a list of properties and ask yourself to produce a graph that satisfies all of those properties. In this one, the first property A, we want the function at 0 to be equal to 0. The second property is that its derivative f prime is the following. It has the following graph that is. Looks like this. Here at 1, we go up to 2. At 2, it is undefined at 1, but it is constant line to the right at the height of 2. And then below here, at minus 1, it's a constant line to the left. That is the graph of the derivative, now, f prime, of the original function f. And finally, the function f is continuous everywhere. So your task is to take these three properties and construct a function and you can do it by constructing the graph of that function, of course, that satisfies all of these properties. Let's see how to attack this problem. Well, the first part is easy. If the function is 0 at 0, there's a point at the origin. So let's draw ourselves a pair of axes here. And we know that there is a point there because f at 0 is equal to 0. Now, what else do we know? We know that the function's continuous everywhere, but that won't really come into play until the last step. The second step is the crucial step here or the crucial fact, I guess I should say. Here is the graph of the derivative. How do we interpret this to get the graph of the original function? Well, remember that the derivative represents the slope, the slope of tangent lines to the function. So what this graph is saying then is that for numbers x below 1, the slope 
of the graph of the function is always the same thing. It's minus 1. And for numbers bigger than 1, to the right, the slope is always equal to 2. So if we now interpret that in a picture, and we mark number 1 here so we know where our boundary line is. And I'll even write dots here so we can see it better. We know that the function to the left of 1 has a slope of minus 1. So it's going to be this function that comes in like this. Here we don't have any derivative. We'll get to that in a second. And then to the right, the slope of the function is always 2. So that's going to be steeper, so maybe we can draw it like this. And then our final property was that the function had to be continuous everywhere, which means that not only do we have a function here and here, but we also have to have a point here that meets up with those two. So this is a graph of that function. Here we see that the slope is equal to 2 always. Here we see that the slope is equal to minus 1 always. And here, because it's connected, the function is continuous. We also notice, because it's a corner, that no derivative exists. At x equals 1, which is the x value here. And if you remember the graph of the derivative function, here you notice that there is no value here at 1. The derivative is, does not exist at 1. And that is what is reflected in this picture. So I hope you got a picture that was similar to this. Now let's go ahead and look at a second problem. And this problem will be the following. What we want to do here is find an equation for the line tangent. We're always interested in tangent lines when derivatives are around. For the line tangent to the following curve, y equals x cubed minus 2x plus 1 at the point on that curve, 0, 1. And then, once you've got the equation now, we want to graph the curve itself. That's this y equals x cubed minus 2x plus 1 curve and the tangent that you've just found. So find the equation of this tangent line and then graph the curve and the tangent at the same time. Let's see what we can come up with here as an answer. First, we want the equation of the tangent line. Now, the equation of any line is going to involve knowing a number of things. W one thing is knowing the point, which we have here. Another thing will be, in this case, knowing the slope of the tangent line. And to get the slope of the tangent line, we will have to use our notion of derivative. So if our original curve, which I'll rewrite here, is y equals x cubed minus 2x plus 1, then we need to find its derivative. Well, we have only one way to find the derivative at this point, and that is by the definition. So let's go ahead and see how the definition plays out here. Remember what we need to do. We need to take this function and evaluate it at x plus h, because remember, it's f of x plus h minus f of x. So we need x plus h here into this function, and then we subtract this function with just the x in it. So that's going to look like x plus h cubed minus 2 times x plus h plus 1 minus then the function x cubed minus 2x plus 1 with just the x in it. And then on the bottom, as usual, we have an h. Now, this is a cube of a binomial. In the future, as we learn more techniques, we won't have to find the derivative using the definition. We'll have more efficient ways to do it. Right now, we don't have those efficient ways. So let's just take a moment to show you just what the algebra is involved in doing this. So to continue that process, we have now the limit as h goes to 0. And once again, I'm going to pull the 1 over h out front to get it out of my way. So now I can just concentrate on, let me bring this back, this expression here at the top. Now my hardest calculation here will be to do the x plus h cubed. So let's go ahead and write that out. If you remember anything about your binomial cube results, 
you know that the result should be x cubed plus 3x squared h plus 3x h squared plus h cubed. And from that, we subtract all the other material that was there. There was a minus 2x minus 2h, a plus 1, and then a minus x cubed plus 2x, and a minus 1. That was all part of that numerator on the previous page. Now this expression here, if you don't remember your algebra, it's probably a good thing to practice at. But we'll just leave that at this point and see what cancels out here, or what adds to 0, which is the better way to say that. So we have an x cubed here and an x cubed here, so the x cubes add to 0. We have a 1 and a 1, so the 1's add to 0. We have a 2x and a 2x with a minus 2x and a 2x, so that adds to 0. So let's see what this all comes out to be as we clean this up. So we have a 3x squared h plus a 3xh squared plus an h cubed. And the x, two x's, as I said, are gone. The 1's and the x cubes are gone, so we're left with just a minus 2h here. What is important to notice about all of this and what happens in all of these situations is that there's an h involved with every one of these. Since there is an h involved with each one, this h can divide into all these different expressions and remove an h, which leaves us with the limit as h goes to 0 of 3x squared plus 3xh plus h squared minus 2. And as the h goes to 0, these expressions involving h both go to 0, and we're just left with 3x squared minus 2. Now what is this again? Remember, this is dy dx. This is a formula for the slopes of lines tangent to this curve. And now we want to use that to address the problem we originally had. What we want to do is find the tangent line. And we know that the point for this tangent line we were given to be 0, 1. And the slope we'll have to calculate, but we have a formula now. What we want to do is calculate dy dx at the point where x equals 0. See, this is the x value here. That's what we need in this function. The formula was 3x squared minus 2, which we now want to evaluate at x equals 0. That's easy. Put 0 in, we end up with minus 2. So our tangent line passes through the point 0, 1 and has slope minus 2 which means it has equation y minus 1 equals minus 2 times x minus 0. And if you simplify that, you get y equals minus 2x plus 1. So there is the equation of the tangent line that we were looking for. That's the first step in the problem. The second, second step, remember, was to produce a graph of the original function and this tangent line passing through 0, 1. Now, you should practice this on your own, but when you do that, and sometimes a graphing calculator can help you at this point. You get a curve that looks something like this. It's passing through here at 1. That happens to be the point, well, here's the point 0, and here is the point 0, 1, which is where we want our tangent line. When we draw our tangent line, we get a line that looks something like this. So here is our original function f of x, which in this case was x cubed minus 2x plus 1. And here is the new tangent line, y equals minus 2x plus 1. And they're drawn on the same set of axes, so we can compare what we've done, and we can verify that we really did get a tangent line, which we were hoping for.